The city of Arcadia, California, celebrating its 75th anniversary, is the host city of the 1978 Youth Safety Run. Officers of the Police Advisory Council for Car Clubs, which has directed the run every year, discuss preliminary strategy with Mayor Dave Perry. The National Guard Armory is used for meetings and staging operations and is the scene of the start and finish of the run. All this was through the courtesy of the commanding officer, Colonel Meister, who was briefed by Council Vice President Jay D'Angelo. Friday, June 16th, is impound day, when the entered cars are thoroughly checked over. These are brand new automobiles, loaned by dealers in the participating cities as their way of helping to further the ideals that the run represents. The main objective always is to promote understanding and cooperation between police and young people. And the officials come from a number of different law enforcement agencies. The run also helps to teach safe driving practices and gives the participants a chance to show their good sense and skill at the wheel. All traffic laws and speed limits are to be observed. The run is not a race. The drivers don't compete for speed, but for fuel economy. No detail can be overlooked. The speedometers are calibrated by the Automobile Club of Southern California. Staging at the armory is coordinated by voice radio, with a technical inspection performed on the cars at Huntington Motors, a Ford dealership several blocks away. Here, officers go over all the vehicles thoroughly to be sure that they conform in every respect to the manufacturer's specifications. The same weight of oil is put into every car. A diagnostic check is made on all vehicles they must comply fully with the California Emission Control Standards. Identical work is performed on each of the 44 cars competing in the run. When all the work has been done, the vehicles are locked and impounded at the armory. Midnight Sunday, June 18th. This is the big night. All of us meet together in the armory for our final briefing. Council President Neil Johnson reveals the route of the run for the first time. The destination is always Yosemite, but the exact route is changed from year to year. It's always kept secret till just before departure, so that no one can pre-drive it. Every car carries the same load, about 550 pounds. The occupants and luggage for each one are weighed. Then the balance is carefully made up in sand, which is sealed in a bag and put into the trunk. Briefing continues. We've been up all night, but nobody has time to feel tired. After a last minute report on detours and road conditions, the time for the start is here. 4 a.m. Monday morning. Movie and TV crews have their cameras ready. The cars are lined up with drivers and observers inside. The signal is given, and we're off. Not like a shot, but in a gentle, gas-thrifty start. Careful handling like this can mean the difference between winning and losing. The eastern horizon is just turning a deep pink as we cross the San Gabriels. By sunup, we're on the high desert. <music> Including official cars, the run involves over 70 vehicles. At our early morning rest stop in Apollo Park, outside Lancaster, parking is done in the most compact arrangement possible. The dispatch crews in bright red jackets stack the cars in the same sequence at every stop on the run. Drivers turn off and restart their engines in the same relative positions so that they all drive exactly the same distance.
We turn back onto the highway again as the cars leave the park at regulated intervals. We're heading north on State Route 14. For every five run cars, there's one patrol car, including two emergency service vehicles from the auto club. We have our own mechanics and gas crews with us, and all official cars keep in contact by radio. As we turn toward the Tehachapi's, the scenery gradually becomes a little more varied. We're even treated to the sight of a golfer, bag of clubs and all, on a motorcycle. We drop down into the San Joaquin Valley through Raisin Vineyards and reach Bakersfield, our first gas stop. All gas and oil used on the run is contributed by the Atlantic Richfield Company. And our gas stops have been scheduled in advance at Arco stations. Cars are again neatly stacked off city streets while waiting for a turn at the pumps. Gas tanks are topped off only at the start and finish of the run. To save time at stops and route, we round it off after the automatic shutoff and move on to the next vehicle. An observer rides in each car. He logs the amount of gas used and then signs for it. Run officials keep a similar record. The observer also makes a full report of any violations made by the drivers of his car. Over coffee and donuts provided by the Bakersfield Civitan Club, we have a chance to socialize a little, to meet new friends and talk about the run. Co-sponsor Gary Canning continues his survey to choose those who will qualify for his own series of awards in several categories. And once again, we head north, now following Route 99. It's late morning, and we're beginning to feel that summer heat. Entry cars are divided by size and type into several classes, and they compete only within their own class. Each class is made as uniform as possible. The differences are found in the drivers. Monday's lunch stop is at cool and shady Roding Park in Fresno. Our chuck wagon has ice cold milk and coke on hand, and we buy the food locally. The menu includes 110 Big Macs, 110 Quarter Pounders with cheese, 220 hamburgers, 220 fries, and 220 pies. Our bill comes to $443. We seem to have proved the theory that driving makes you hungry. Our second gas stop is at an Arco station nearby. Then we head up into the foothills toward vacation country. Once we spot the snow-topped mountains on the horizon ahead, we know that the northbound half of the run is almost over. The incomparable valley our home for the next two nights is Camp Curry. The cars are once again stacked tight, actually very tight, and locked and impounded till departure time Wednesday morning. 
Everyone looks up instinctively at the great trees and granite cliffs towering overhead. In line for room assignments, all of us have the same thought in mind. We're close at last to a good night's sleep. Next morning, there's time to enjoy the valley. Everyone who knows the park remarks on the unusually large volume of water in the falls and river this year. For the first time visitor, just being in Yosemite is a special thrill. All officials, meanwhile, attend a mandatory meeting to correct the few problems that have inevitably arisen and to tighten procedures for the return trip. Outside, some frisbee play builds good appetites for a hearty lunch at the cafeteria. Contestants are not allowed to drive during our stay in the valley. But after the meal, in official cars driven by officials, we head for the scenic and literal high point of the trip. Glacier Point, far above the valley floor, with its splendid views of the shining peaks of the high Sierra. In the midst of all this glorious scenery, it's not easy to pick out our neatly stacked cars, over 3,000 feet straight down below us. Then, all too soon, it's 6 a.m. Wednesday, June 21st. An early breakfast before we set out on the homeward-bound half of the run. Before the sun's rays have reached the valley floor, we meet in the parking area for a last-minute briefing. There are some small improvements in routine, but no highway problems or route changes to report. And right on schedule, we're back on the road again, departing at intervals, heading west for Modesto. By the time the last car leaves the valley, the first car is about 30 miles ahead. The routes that are chosen for the run each year always offer a variety of driving situations. Mountain and desert, country and city, two-lane road and interstate. The drivers cope with it all, but also with unexpected things like construction zones and earth-moving equipment. Our third gas stop is in Modesto. The cars are stacked on a quiet street, and there's a welcome mid-morning energy snack all set up and waiting for us at a small city park nearby. Then we turn south on busy State 99. Back again at Roding Park in Fresno for lunch, we put away very nearly as much food as we did the first time through. We leave the freeway at the town of Selma and pick up a state highway through endless miles of farmlands. Our fourth gas stop is at our junction with Interstate 5, a cluster of service stations called Lost Hills. No one understands how it got its name. The place is flat as a pancake and right on the freeway. It's hot, and this time there's no shade. We've driven almost exactly 700 miles on the run so far. Now, Arcadia and the finish line are only about 150 miles ahead. 
then up the grapevine to the brake inspection area off the highway near Gorman. By now, the sun is low in the sky. Here, to break the monotony of freeway travel, we change drivers. All participants in the run are chosen from explorer posts and car clubs by their police advisors. The hometown of the observer in each car is always different from that of his drivers, so that his reports won't be influenced by civic pride. Nine thirty Wednesday night. Council officers are at the finish line. So are crowds of friends and relatives. Each engine is cut as the flag drops, and the cars are pushed to their parking slots. And with happiness and high hopes in every contestant's heart, the 1978 Youth Safety Run comes to an end. But there's still work to be done. In a series of long meetings, the Council's Board of Stewards tabulates the scores. All reports from observers and officials are studied. Penalties are assessed for any violations of the vehicle code or the rules of the run. Eventually, the roster of names begins to narrow down, and the trophy winners are chosen at last. Meanwhile, the final topping off is done. Every last bubble of air is bounced out, and officials, using their own gas pump, record the precise amount of gas put into each car. Friday evening, June 23rd, at the Hilton Hotel in Pasadena. The awards banquet. Sergeant Ernie Hovard, charter member of the PACCC, receives a plaque upon his retirement from the Pasadena Police Department. Representatives of the run's co-sponsors say a few words. First, Gene Owings from the Atlantic Richfield Company. Jack Michaels from the Arcadia Civitan Club. His organization presents a framed certificate of commendation to every participant. Winners of the Council Awards are announced next. President Neil Johnson presents the trophies. There are awards for observers, in addition to those for the driver and co-driver of the winning entry in each class. Our participants have produced new and accurate miles per gallon statistics, proved on the highway in real and varied driving situations. The Canning Awards follow trophies and round-the-world trips for the most outstanding participants. As the banquet comes to an end, out of the crowd of youthful voices come a few words here and there that give the final verdict. Happy and excited. I loved it. Oh, beautiful. Tired but excited, hoping that we'd win. <laughs> really nice. We wish you could have stayed longer. I loved it. Oh, beautiful.